where you want to go? Because I can go anywhere, and I don't mind talking about it. You want to go hard drugs? I can go hard drugs. You want to go prostitutes? I got a prostitution story. Gun shootouts? I got shootout stories. You want to go molestation? I got that. You want to go abuse? Physical abuse? I got that. You want to go abandonment? I got that. Where you want to go? I don't want to be known for my flaws, but let me tell you something. People grow more from the suffering you share with them than the wisdom you hurl at them. This is The Deep End with LaCroix. What makes you feel uncomfortable to be vulnerable like that? What makes me feel comfortable being vulnerable has probably little to do with my disposition or like just some kind of innate quality within me. Um, It has more to do with time and being able to practice this with close friends in close proximity. Some friends of mine said, let's start an accountability group. And for me, um, I didn't understand that concept. What is accountability? What is an accountability group? But I went with it. You could lie if you wanted to. Um, But what I found is that, you know, lying about what is damaging you does not benefit you. It actually hurts you. It's like lying about having a deadly disease. It doesn't benefit you in any kind of way to lie to yourself and to others. It's like, why would, why would you go around pretending you don't have a deadly disease that, that, that is going to eventually catch up to you and kill you. But a lot of us don't want to know what's wrong with us because if we know what's wrong with us, then we have to deal with it. Or we don't have the emotional capacity, uh, and categories to deal with what's actually hurting us. Um, And so for many folks, it's easier to just keep walking through that. And I just got tired of it. You know, other thing you got to remember for me is uh, I grew up with a mother who was like an investigator. You know, my mom just you couldn't pull the wool over her eyes. I remember coming home with my cousin high out my mind and she just took one look at me and knew I was high. And it wasn't like, you've been smoking weed. It was more of a, oh, I'm going to mess with you. I'm going to have a field day with this one. She starts playing spooky music and putting her fingers in my face. And so I I lived in this space with my mother who she she just was not easily fooled. And it wasn't no pulling the wool over over her eyes. And so I distinctly remember, um, you know, being a uh, promiscuous young teenager and... um, contracting something that is curable. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, But then I went to the doctor and I tried to go to the doctor behind her back. Well, where do they send the letter? To the house. Okay. My mom sees a letter from the doctor. Like, uh, what is, why does he have a letter to the, coming from the doctor? When has he been to the doctor? So she's going to open it. And she did. And she's like, what is this? So now I'm like busted out. And it's like, it's doubly embarrassing that your mom knows you're out here, you know, uh, just freelancing and getting nasty and naked in high school with everything moving. And then two, you, you caught a, a, a sexually transmitted disease in the process of it. And so it's like, man, I'm on front street immediately. So I think I just had been down this road so many times. I've been exposed so many times that it got to a point where, man, I don't, I'm just tired of hiding. You know, you get tired of it. it you get burned out. People hide and are not vulnerable because they're afraid of what they'll lose, right? And there's real loss um, in our society for being vulnerable, for being transparent, right? You do stand to lose, you know, loved ones, the respect of others, jobs, money, careers. You stand to lose from being transparent or being vulnerable or being honest. Um, But the, the unique thing is, as a Christian, right? My hope, my identity should no longer be grounded in what I own, what I have, um, who I'm with. My identity is found in being known by the creator of the universe. My purpose is not something that I achieved. My purpose was received from God. 
And now I'm supposed to be in this community of people who accept me unconditionally, right? Who will walk with me and I am no longer at risk of losing their love or their respect because no matter what I have going on, these people have committed to be with me. Um, and so when you taste that in real time, you don't have to be afraid. The problem is most Christians haven't tasted that. They haven't put themselves in a position to be fully integrated with other folks who will embrace them unconditionally. They, we're still at a place where we're embarrassed for whatever reason to talk about how much money's in our account. Why? Because we think our worth is intrinsically connected to how much money we have. Like that's what's your net worth as if that's my, my literal worth. And so we're, we don't want anyone to know how much money we have, how much money we make, how much money we get, because we don't want anyone to think less of us or to have a preconceived idea of who we are. I share how much money's in my account with, with my friends, with my close circle. You know why? Because I want accountability, because I want to make sure I'm stewarding what I have correctly, not because there's something for them to judge or not because I'm somehow more valuable than them, but because, man, I want people to know and people to challenge me based off of what I have going on. So when you're outside of that Christian community, that authentic integrated community, and maybe you're not, maybe folks aren't Christian, but they still have an integrated community, right? Like there's people who don't exist in Christian circles. They are still more integrated than some Christians are. And integration just means, man, I'm connected to you in such a way that what you do is not who you are. Your actions are not your identity. Your actions are just things that you've done. And so for me, um, I'm always wanting to encourage people and challenge people to not view themselves and their worth by what they own, by what they have, by what they've done, but literally understand that, man, they've been made in the likeness and the image of God and their worth is eternal. Um, and so, you know, I could go on and on. We can go a different way with this altogether, but at the end of the day, people don't realize that their worth is not what other people think about them. And I say it all the time and I'll say it again. If you live for their acceptance, you die from their rejection. The people are just scared of rejection. Historically, when I think of all the major pastors who fall in, the people who are, you know, um, leaders in high positions from, you know, mega church pastors to shoot Dr. Martin Luther King, I think that along the line, they were concerned with keeping up the front, with keeping up the face. And some of them may have felt like I have good reason, right? Oftentimes it's like, well, if, if I fail, the movement fails, right? If I fall, everything that I'm leading falls, which is actually arrogant on our part, right, as leaders, because we think that we're the foundation when God is actually the foundation of it. And so there was a time period in my life where I felt that way, where I felt like I'm the face. I can't fall. I can't afford to mess up or to be exposed. And little by little, God just had to remind me, you, it didn't start with you. It doesn't end with you. You know, th this is a movie, right? Life is a movie. You're not the main character. You're hardly an extra right? <laughs> You're hardly an extra. And by the grace of God, I'm giving you more opportunities to play a part in this, this grand film called history. Um, but it doesn't start with us. It doesn't end with us. It's not as if the exposure of our frailty and our humanity somehow um, messes up God's plans. I think our problem, specifically as you know, Westerners as Americans is we love to villainize people and lionize people. And no individual is as heroic as we make them out to be, nor are any villains as villainous as we make them out to be. I mean, when you look at our movies, you know, we love a good hero. We don't really love a flawed hero. We want a hero who's got it all right and all perfect and has got it together historically we have, we, we like them now a little flawed, but historically we loved just per picture perfect heroes. And I think the problem is no human is, we're, we're very nuanced, 
right? Some of us are really jacked up and really amazing. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King is one of my favorite characters, period. We know he was flawed, right? When you really start digging into his history, it's like, man, the man battled depression. Mahalia Jackson had to sing to him for him to get out of the bed. We know he, he wrestled with infidelity. You know, um, we know that he struggled with, you know, the acceptance of certain audiences. But at the same time, he was amazing. He was well-read, studied, was, you know, firm on some amazing convictions. And he literally transformed the way that our society functions in America. And so you can't lionize him as this picture perfect person and you cannot villainize him as someone who's unworthy of our admiration or respect. And I think a lot of us um, fall in that category. And I fell there until I realized I'm neither. I'm, I'm both fearfully and wonderfully made and deeply loved by God and I'm also more wretched than I even understand, right? I'm more sinful than I am broken than I even understand. And that's what makes me human. Um, and so that's all of us. Christian leaders have to stop positioning themselves as gurus. We're not gurus, man. We're not icons who have all the solutions. And you start positioning yourself as those type of people, people are going to lift you up only to find your flaws and tear you down. It's the way we're positioning ourselves, especially... Like we live in a very, you know, extroverted society. We, we exalt the extrovert. Most of us aren't extroverted. You know, most of us are chill. We don't want to be the loudest person in the room and the, hey guys, welcome everybody. But that's the caricature that we portray in society. So everyone feels like they have to fit that mold. We got to stop it, right? We're not happy all the time gurus who are just full of just, you know, excitement and passion and I know how to sell you on something. That's not who we are. We're far more dynamic than that. And the leaders that I think demonstrate the most health are the leaders who can acknowledge their own brokenness, acknowledge where they struggle, who can publicly articulate, hey, this is an area that I'm not well versed in. Um, I, I remember, and I'm, it's not to say Paris is like better, but I do remember doing a tour of Paris and as I'm going through Paris, I'm looking at their monuments and stuff. And it's like, oh, yeah, this is where these people were brutalized. And this is a statue commemorating all the damage done to these folks. And I was like, oh, wow, y'all are just acknowledging where you went wrong in society. And I think America is so young and it's been little brother that it's fearful of showing its flaws. It's fearful of saying, well, here's where we messed up because we don't want anyone to look at us and say, "Ooh," right. I, I said it in in still in America, you know, um, we we hide the areas that we've 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 gone astray instead of acknowledging them openly. You know, we'd rather take it out of the history books instead of leaving it there to learn from. Um, and I think that's obviously we don't want to highlight. No one wants to have their flaws highlighted all the time. Like, I don't want that. I don't want to be known for my flaws. But let me tell you something. People grow more. From the suffering you share with them than the wisdom you hurl at them. So share your sufferings, your flaws, your struggles. They grow more from your struggles than, than because they feel like, man, I can connect with you in a real way versus you're too perfect for me. Uh, I, I remember this. I remember working at uh, Kroger and I was a cashier and um, you know, it was a suburban Kroger. They paid so well. And I remember working in there and I felt so like, like I didn't fit, you know, like I couldn't be myself because everyone who came in was somebody out of my cultural context. And so when they came in, you know, hey, how you doing today? Oh, da, 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 da. And it's just a face. It was a face. But every so often, somebody will wander in from like a, 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 a little more of a, a tougher background or a rougher part of town or something. And, you know, maybe they came from the hood or the trailer park and they came in there just to buy a pack of cigarettes and they had visible tattoos and something in me just sighed like, oh, a real person. Right. Like I can be myself because for me, what it said was they're not afraid to show the, themselves the, the candid version of who they are. 
right? Smoking's not okay. It's not, I mean, it's not a healthy thing, but they were like, look, it's not healthy and I know it, I'm buying cigarettes, right? It was like, hey, these visible tattoos are not the status quo, especially back when I was a teenager, but I got them and I'm not afraid to show them. I respected that because I knew what I was dealing with. I knew who was in front of me. There wasn't a mask or a veneer. It was, hey, this is who I am, raw and real. And it made me, it endeared me toward them. And I think that's what vulnerability and transparency does for folks. It endears folks toward you. It's funny that you still remember that Kroger as paid well in life of <laughs> where you're at now. Oh, shoot. Yeah, man. You, you know, you get to suburban grocery stores, man. You just drive your car. You know, you got to go to the nice. It's like trick-or-treating. You go to the nice neighborhood to go trick-or-treating. You don't stay in the bad one. You know what I mean? So you go find you a job at the nice Chick-fil-A or the nice Kroger or Publix or whatever it is. You know, that's, that's going to be a better paying situation for you. I feel like our society is just set up for us to be overly concerned with, you know, what people think of us. And obviously, I fall into that trap. I fall into it every day, right? It's why I don't get too caught up in social media. It's why I try to post and move on out the way so that I'm not too caught up in who's looking at it, who's not looking at it. Um, you know, because it's a dopamine fix for us all. We all want to be accepted. And, and social media, the, 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 the masterminds behind social media platforms know that about us. We want acceptance, right? We want to be movie stars and TV stars and social media influencers. We want to win at being valuable. And, you know, we're afraid of flaws messing up our value. But the truth of the matter is being yourself, we all need to grow. We all need some therapy, I'm sure, but you will never have to worry about keeping up the facade or keeping up the face or wondering if they really like you or they like this idea of you, if you're yourself. I used to micromanage the way I presented myself. I literally, like the way I spoke around people, the way I looked, the way I communicated, just let me just charm their socks off so that I can be embraced by them so that I can advance in whatever kind of way I wanted to. And, you know, I remember a couple different scenarios they, they say you end up marrying, you know, like your mom, if you're a guy or your dad, if you're a girl, they say that happens sometimes. I definitely think in some senses, like the character of my mother exists in my wife. They don't care. They're just not overly concerned with what everyone else thinks about them. That is a waste of their, their mental energy. And I, I remember being a kid, we had moved. So we stayed in the urban environment all the time. You know, I stayed in the hood. I stayed in, in areas that were, you know, predominantly black. I went to hood schools and my mom remarried and we moved to a nicer neighborhood my last two years of high school. And so now I got these girls, these, these black girls who speak the King's English, so to speak, you know, they, they, they're articulate and they're coming over to visit and I'm introducing them to my mom. And it was the first time I was ever embarrassed of my mom's like soulful Houston accent. You know, and so these girls are coming over like, hey, how are you doing? I'm going to Hampton. I'm going to Howard. Um, it's nice to meet you. Da, da, da. My mom's like, hey, girl, how you doing? You know, what's your name? Where, where you stay? Where your mama from? And I was like, oh, no, 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 mom. No, 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 no. We got we to gotta come off like we, we're from this. We got to come off like we're cut from this cloth. I'm a college kid, you know, and it, and it, was, it was stupid, right? It, because it wasn't really who I was when I let my hair down. Right? That wasn't actually who I was when I let my hair down. My wife, the same way I used to micromanage her. Don't say that. Say this. Don't do that. Do this. Look this way. Let me only post pictures of you that are uh, very complimentary, to, you know, like not, you know, and that's too much. It stresses her out. She's like, what? This is dumb. How come I can't just show up as me? Am I not enough? And what I found is people love her authenticity. She's not fake. She doesn't know how to be fake. And that's what people gravitate toward. And that's what people love. No one, everyone may look at you sideways like, whoa, they're being too real. But that's only because they're not healed enough to be whole and real. And so they still value the plastic, you know, fraudulent facade that people give them versus the authentic love that that we should all be able to experience from being ourselves, 
right? It doesn't mean there's not areas we need to grow in and be challenged in that, but why be fake? It's too hard to be fake. It's easy to be real. You say compared to your wife, she's way more real than you. <laughs> yeah, big time, man. My, my wife is, you know, she's, she's the realist. I'm the romantic. And the romantic tends to idealize and fantasize. And there's, there's benefits to that. But the realist is like, hey, this is the reality. And for her, you know, she didn't grow up. I grew up in a broken family. I grew up detached, broken family. No man ever told me, I'm really proud of you. Man, I'm so, man, I love you. I love you, man. I never heard that. Um, you know, my mother couldn't afford to be very like lovey-dovey nurturing because she was raising a man as a single mom and was afraid that I wasn't going to be tough enough and that I was going to end up, you know, out here in the world and not know what it means to be a man. And so I'm growing up in need of this affirmation, in need of this love and, and this, like, you're doing a good job. I'm so proud of you. I'm, I'm growing up hungering and thirsting for that. My wife grew up in a very secure family. Her dad was there her whole life. Her mom's there her whole life. It's not broken. It's nothing crazy going on. No abuse, no molestation, secure, happy, family obviously not without its problems and we all got our issues but she grows up saying I've been myself my whole life and it's worked out well for me meanwhile me I'm like I gotta become something so that I can get the love I never had I gotta I gotta dance I gotta sing I gotta accomplish I gotta win so that someone will say good job I'm proud of you so that I can get that blue ribbon at field day instead of the red one Right. And, and that's what life became about. It became about how do I get a blue ribbon? Because if I don't get a blue ribbon, I don't have any worth. And if they know the real me, I'm not going to get a blue ribbon. Right. I'm, I'm not going to win. So I can't be the real me. And what I learned is, man, I already won, especially as a believer. I already won. I got a cloud of many witnesses cheering me on saying, you're doing it. You're killing it. Elijah, Moses, David are up there cheering me on as I'm racing down here on earth. And they're saying, keep going. I already won. The creator of the universe is saying, man, I love you. And I have nothing to earn. I have, I, I'm not fighting out of earning something. I'm fighting because I'm already loved. I'm living out of that love. So when you're living out of love, you're not chasing the blue ribbons. My wife has been known, she, she knew she was loved as a child. And now as a child of God, she knows she's loved. She's not chasing anything. She's just living and being real. And I mean, it's a free and a beautiful space to exist in. A lot of folks may see me and say, easy for you to say, right? What have you lost? Matter of fact, you've gained it all. Um, I'm just trying to gain something. And I, I, I understand where you're coming from, but what you gotta understand for me is that I, I've lost it all too, right? Um, in, 2014, I had the number one album in the country. You know, uh, went on to win Grammy after Grammy. And then, and, and was a darling in a lot of conservative evangelical circles. And I lived for the affirmation and the praise of some of those Christian leaders and thinkers. Um, and by 2017, I was hated by most of those communities, right? For being authentically me. Um, and to someone else, it may seem like, well, psh, you already had one anyway, yeah, but it doesn't matter if what I wanted, I didn't have. It doesn't matter if what I thought gave me worth was stripped away from me. Now I feel like I've lost, right? We, we, we often tend to judge people based off of, you know, their particular brand of suffering. So we'll say, well, you know, so-and-so was a fentanyl addict and lost his house and so-and-so just got divorced. I mean, no, no, no. Both of them are devastating to those particular individuals because they lost what mattered to them. They lost what was valuable to them. So, you know, for me, I lost everything that I was trying to build for the sake of being authentically me. And that was painful. And I had to grow through that and learn from that, right? Now, hindsight, I can look at it and say that's petty, 
but it also cost me my family in a lot of ways. It cost my wife saying, hey, I don't know what this is, this whole you gone all the time. My kids saying, dad, why are you always gone? And not having a connection with my kids, that's the thing I wanted more than anything in the world. I didn't grow up with my father. The last thing I wanted was my kids to feel the same way. So in many ways I felt like I lost. And there's nothing wrong with accomplishing things. Matter of fact, I want everybody to win. But at the same time, if you can't live with a sense of contentment, that, that monster is always going to be knocking at your door. You're never going to be satisfied. Never. You're, if you can't find contentment with who God has made you to be and the things that you've accomplished today, you're, you're not going to be satisfied. Right. You're going to make 60 grand and you're going to say, man, I made it. And then you're going to be around people who make 80 grand and you're going to be like, dang, I, I, I got to get my money up. Then you're going to make 80 grand because you've been around these folks. And then being in an 80 grand bracket is going to put you shopping at stores with people who make 100. Now you're going to say, I need to make 100. And 100 to two, to two to four, to four to eight is not going to stop. There's not like a like no amount of money is ever going to be enough. When's the last time you ate a meal and said, no, I'm not hungry anymore for life, right? When's the last time somebody had sex and said, that was so amazing, I never need to do that ever again. That's not the way it works, right? You're gonna keep wanting the next level, the next level again and again and again. And so if you can't find yourself content and find yourself like, man, thank you God for this day, for this moment, for this opportunity, you're gonna constantly be chasing blue ribbons for the rest of your life. And so everything you see, every award, every plaque, every accolade, you know, those are the result of me sowing a lot of seeds of discontentment. Those are a lot of the results of me sowing a lot of seeds of insecurity. Those are just the, the, what's, what's sprung up. Very few of the things that I've won did I win from being content and just being myself. Most of them are the fruit of insecurity. And if you ask any artist, go ask Drake, go ask Madonna. Madonna said it. They're all fighting the same thing internally. I don't want to be irrelevant. I don't want to not matter anymore. It's all coming from a place of insecurity, all coming from a place of discontentment. What <clears throat> I've had to struggle to do is to just let people in. And um, the hardest part about letting people in is the fear that they're gonna leave. Because this is what happens. You find yourself in a situation where you've experienced some pain. You make a decision to be vulnerable. That vulnerability is either misused or mocked. And now you clam up. And because you've clammed up and not integrated yourself with other people, you have more hurt. Maybe down the line, you get a little therapy or some healing. You say, you know what? I'm going to be vulnerable again. Then you're vulnerable. Your vulnerability is met again with misuse or mockery. And then you clam up and suffer some pain and don't want to tell anybody about it. Then it comes out again and it becomes this cycle. And until we embrace that some people are not going to fully grasp our transparency, our vulnerability, that we're going to be misunderstood. Like until we can embrace that, we're, we're going to constantly clam up and not share. Um, and I'm not telling you to share your business with the world. You know, I do it because I know I'm a public figure and people pay attention. And if people are paying attention, well, shoot, let me give them some freedom. I'm not telling you to share with the whole world, but somebody has to, right? Like somebody's got to do it. So I'm sharing because I want to liberate other people. I'm not telling you to tell the whole world, but I'm telling you to tell somebody that you can trust. And what I've had to do is I've had to let people in. I've had to just be like, look, I don't really like you like that, but I do notice that you genuinely care about me, that you're always challenging me to be the best version of me. And that's kind of why I don't like you because I'm not really trying to be the best version of me right now. So I'm kind of keeping you at bay. And eventually you're going to hit rock bottom. And I had to hit rock bottom for me to say, all right, all right, man, this, this, this individual that I kept at bay because I knew they were good for me, I'm going to bring them in. Um, 
these couple of other people that have been consistently by my side, but I was scared to tell them what was really going on with me because I thought they would leave. Let me take that risk. And guess what? They didn't leave. They, they, they rocked with me. They stood by my side. And so everybody doesn't have that, but it's worth, to, it's worth fighting for, right? It's worth going out and being disappointed and being rejected to find some friends you can be fully integrated with because you're going to need them. You don't want to die lonely, burying a lifetime of guilt and shame, never being able to be your full self. You want to have places and spaces where you can be completely all of you. Like most of us live dualistic lives. Like we got our work self and our home self. Most of us, right? We're not our full self at work, right? Because this is a professional setting. I can't, you know, walk into work like, hey, what's going on, everybody? You, you know what it is. I, like if that's my full self, if I work at a, as a, a doctor, I probably can't do that, right? I mean, you could. You probably attract a certain type of clientele and maybe that's what you wanted. But we all kind of wear this, this mask in a sense. And so where do you, where can you go to be your full authentic self? You need that. You know what trauma is? Trauma is not a bunch of things that happen to you. Trauma is things happening to you and you having nowhere to address them. They're stored up and you're bleeding internally. There's no place to get healing. For me, I've had to find friends and just be fully integrated. They know it all, right? So uh, studies show we all need, you know, one to four very close friends. We need that. That's what studies show, create a happy life. One to four really close friends. And then outside of that, we're, we benefit from having about, you know, four to 12 kind of not as close, but still like people we can touch, we can reach out to. You could be completely vulnerable with that four to 12, but you don't necessarily have to because you got your one to four. And then outside of that, you may have the capacity, you know, for 12 to maybe 30 people like that you can really call a part of your community. And so you got to have your one to four. You got to or you're not going to thrive. You're going to deal with trauma because there's nowhere you can go to release what's going on inside. I saw a girl on TikTok. She was literally having a mental breakdown because she wanted a hug. She had nobody to give her a hug. Now, I don't, I don't know the story behind that or the legitimacy to it, but I wouldn't be shocked if it was legit because we live in these isolated bubbles. We don't have friends. We don't have connections. We don't have anybody to be our full selves with, and therefore we suffer. Nowadays, I have a gauge. Um, you know, my gauge is if I find myself not wanting to engage with my one to four, um, then I'm moving in an unhealthy direction, right? No one drifts toward health. That's not how this works. You don't, you don't just like, man, I don't know why I just been losing all this weight and gaining all this muscle. I don't know why my bowels have just been moving properly. I don't know why my teeth are just clean. My breath is fresh. That, that's not how that works right? No one drifts toward health. You actually drift in the opposite direction. Most of us say, man, I don't know why my, I'm backed up like this. I don't know why my breath smells like this. I don't know why my attitude has been like this because we're drifting toward unhealth. That's how it works. So you have to be actively pursuing health. And I find myself drifting and finding myself in a place where it's like, mm, I kind of enjoy not have having interacted with my close friends. That's actually unhealthy. And that's funner in some senses, but it's not good for my soul, right? It's funner to eat a whole bag of golden Oreos. That's funner, right? It's like, I'd rather eat that than broccoli, but I need broccoli. And, I, and my body thanks me for it when I do eat it. And in the same way, I've never left the fellowship of my good friends and been like, ugh, 
Why did I do that? That was a waste of time. I always leave refreshed, like, that was good. We needed that, right? That's generally how it works. So for me, I notice I'm drifting toward unhealth when I'm finding myself trying to isolate. We are not created to be isolated. We were created for community. God calls us a body for a reason, right? Like we're called a body. And, you know, a lot of people will throw around the, con the idea of like, you know, love your neighbor. Yeah, that worked in the context that Jesus was existing in. We take it all the way out of context when we talk about love your neighbor. Most of us don't even know our neighbors. So you don't need your neighbor. But when Paul starts talking about a body, now, now it gets sticky because you do need your arm. You do need your leg. You cannot function without those body parts. You need those eyes and those ears. You don't need your neighbor, but you do need your body parts. And so we're supposed to be a body. I need to be connected to the body. Um, even when Paul is, is talking about, or Hebrew says, don't forsake the fellowship. We get that so messed up out of context. Like here in America, we'll say, oh, don't forsake the fellowship. I need to see you in church on Sunday. Why? So I can be one out of 2,000 people and I don't have to speak to a soul? So I can just sit in the pews by myself and listen to a great message that I could have listened to at my house? That's, that, I'm still forsaking the fellowship. That's not what Paul is talking about. That's not what Hebrews is saying. Forsaking the fellowship is you haven't spent time with people who love God and love you. You haven't interacted and connected with them, right? Anybody can show up on Sunday and sit in a room full of thousands of people, full of 500 people. That doesn't mean you're, in, you're, you're integrated. That doesn't mean you're fellowshipping and you're connected. And so isolation is me really kind of fleshing out what society is teaching us to be rugged individualists and not to be a body, not to be connected in community. Let me tell you, the thing my wife hates the most is when I'm presenting, is when I'm like performing, but not performing for the sake of like the stage, but for the sake of interaction and connecting with people. Um, and I've done it a few times, like, you know, <laughs> it's an ongoing joke, not just with my wife, but even other artists, you know, on a team, like whenever we would travel to foreign countries, somehow I would end up having the accent of the country that we found ourselves in, you know, because I'm just trying to like accommodate and present and perform, you know, uh, and it's like, you know, mirror neurons, you know, I'm like mirroring these people um, because I want to be accepted. And I don't even realize I'm doing it. And my wife would be so mad, like, cut it out. This is embarrassing, you know. Um, it, there's also been times where I think another thing about it is, is how I survived. You know, I went to multiple schools as a kid. And so it was like, oh, I'm, you know, three different high schools, two different middle schools. Let me become somebody different here so that I could fit in. Let me figure out who I need to be to survive in this particular environment. And you know, it, it stuck as like a defense mechanism in order to protect myself from not being ostracized or hurt in some, some senses. And now, man, I'm so like, I'm so confident and excited to be authentic me. I see the superpower that it is. Listen, it's funny. Um, you know, I don't know how people feel about the Enneagram and so on and so forth. Uh, some people may be on the side of it's the most evil thing in the world. Some people may be on the side of it's just a weird personality test. But typically, I would be seen as an achiever who, you know, performs and is charming and will spin it once I'm confronted with something difficult or hard to answer or ask. And you know, I was talking to someone who like kind of specializes in this personality type and they said, man, you're not acting like that type of a person. Either A, you aren't really, that's not your personality type or B, you're just the healthiest version of this personality type because you're just embracing hard truths and hard things and, and owning it. And I'd like to hope it's the latter, you know, that I'm just embracing things and not spinning it to make myself look better. It's always gonna be a struggle because, you know, I'm, I'm a broken person living on earth. It, it's just, I'm okay with acknowledging the struggle. And also I'm not like saying, I'm okay with 
wrestling with the tension of it and not succumbing to it. Like it's, a, it's one thing with saying, I accept fighting. Another thing was saying, like, I don't want to fight and I just, it, it wins. Um, and I'm just, man, I just know this is going to be my fight. So why not just fight diligently and let it overtake me and become the type of person that I'm supposed to be versus the type of person that, you know, I always thought I needed to be in order to survive.